thank God for this moment in history where we get an opportunity, as Pastor Tim Delina, our senior pastor, has been talking about, to, to get into the Word and to begin to pray. And I heard Pastor Tim say recently that we have to become a supernatural people again, and I believe that with all my heart. The kingdom of God is not advanced through human strategy or human ingenuity. The kingdom of God is advanced by ordinary people like you and I. And in this case, uh, tonight it's the addicted, the afflicted, the depressed, the, the, the hurting, the nobodies and nothings of society that God is going to raise up one more time. And as you begin to read His Word and begin to talk to Him, He's going to start talking to you. And He's going to raise you up out of weakness and give you strength and take you into places to do things that you never believed you could ever do that will bring glory to His name because you know and others will know that only God could have done this through you. So take heart. I believe that in our generation, no matter how dark it looks, it's going to be exactly as it was in the beginning. God's going to take this whole uh, group of failures in our generation and those who know they need a Savior, and He's going to raise up an army one more time to bring glory to His name. And you're going to be part of that army. So I'm not speaking to anybody online tonight as if you're addicted and afflicted and oppressed and then imprisoned and all of these other uh, diagnoses that you'd want to place on yourself and others would want to put on you as well. I'm speaking to you as the victorious army of God that he's going to raise up in this last generation. You're going to stand in the strength of God and you're going to do exploits, the scripture tells us. Those who know their God, Daniel said, in these days are going to do exploits. You're going to stand, and God is going to do through you things that only God can do, that He might receive all of the glory, because He shares His glory with none other. And by taking you and I, when we are in the position of weakness, we know then that only God could be doing this, and we are very quick to give Him the glory. We're not quick to touch it for ourselves. Tonight, I'm going to speak to you from the gospel of James, the epistle of uh, James, if you'll turn there, if you have a device of some sort where you can uh, get access to that. And I'm going to talk to you about the forward motion of faith, what faith really is, how faith is something that's beyond just learning or beyond just understanding Scripture. Some people think that because they believe Scripture, they have faith. Not necessarily so. You just have a mental agreement with um, the Word of God. It doesn't mean that you're a person of faith. So, Father, I thank you tonight, God, for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord, for how you are moving your people forward. I thank you for prayer. I thank you for fasting. I thank you for your word. I thank you for faith. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to raise up an army all over this world, an army who are submitting prayer requests, an army who feel unlovely and unworthy in many cases. But it's in that unloveliness and unworthiness that you become everything to your people. And you raise us up, O oh God, out of the ashes and produce something of beauty for your namesake and for your glory. God Almighty, I ask you for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus Christ, don't let the sharing be just the accumulation of more knowledge, but let us move forward in faith. Help us, my God, from this day forward, never to be stagnant, never to go backwards or stand still. But you are always leading to something that brings glory to your name and your name alone. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. James chapter 2, beginning at verse 14. I'm talking about the forward motion of faith. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. 
and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. That's a phenomenal statement. That one line of Scripture is the body without the spirit of is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You see, there's, there's, there's this erroneous thought that the accumulation of knowledge somehow in, in this or any other generation is actually faith. But true faith is not stagnant. True faith does not stand in one place. True faith starts moving forward into that which God is desiring to accomplish through the life that belongs to Him. You see, this is what James is implying. True faith moves into something that only God can do, and it, it always moves into a mountain of fallen humanity and human need. That's, that's the point he's trying to make. Don't say you have faith if you're not willing to go into the work of God. If, if you're not willing to be led by God into the places that only God can take you, to do the things that only God can put in your heart to do, then don't declare yourself to be a person of faith if that's not what your life is all about. Learning is not faith. Learning is a good thing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So it's wonderful to learn the Word of God. But the Word of God and communication with God leads us into a place where God is determining to do through us what He has destined our lives to be from the time we were conceived in our mother's womb. God had a plan for you and God had a plan for me. And when faith comes into our heart, we start moving towards that that plan. Paul the Apostle warns us in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 7 that in the last days, many of God's people will be characterized by this, this one thing. They're always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, always accumulating knowledge. But the knowledge never takes them to forward motion, to that place where the knowledge of God should take us to. We, we are given, as the Scripture says, a new mind. In other words, there are new thoughts that God plants in our mind. We're, we're given a new heart. We, we start moving towards human need around us, the human condition. We start moving into the actual work of God, which is the redemption of fallen humanity. And we're given a new spirit by, the, by God, which means that we're given courage maybe that's not our own, the ability to hear the voice of God when He says, this is the way, walk ye in it. It is a wonderful thing to be a supernatural person in Christ. That means we're taken out of the natural by the Spirit of God. We're given faith to believe God by the Word of God because the things that God speaks are true. They're eternal truths. They, they, they can't be taken away. This is who God is. This is what God does. And every life that will accomplish something for God moves towards its purpose by that which God supplies. Now, here's a point I want you to think about. For what you are called to do, every person who's listening tonight, God has given you exactly what you need to accomplish it. You don't have to add to it. You don't have to take away from it. He knows what you need. In the book of Esther, this young girl was raised up by God and planted in the king's court sovereignly for a specific time in history. Truly amazing. But this young girl had to go through a test, I believe, before God could use her. And here's where the test really begins. In Esther chapter 2 and verse 15, it says, Now when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women, advised. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. And Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus in his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Teba, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And I, I love the fact, this was the initial test. God had a specific plan for Esther. And she didn't add to that plan. She didn't take away from that plan. There, there was a trust in this young girl's heart. She didn't ask. She didn't, try to, 
She didn't try to procure other things other than what was provided. What, what it really tells me is that she said, I'm in the hands of God, and whatever God provides for me, that's, what, that's all that I'm going to need to accomplish what He has called me to do. You see, a lot of people miss out on the plan of God because they scheme and they add things to the plan of God, to the purpose of God, and to the, the things that God gives to accomplish uh, what our lives are supposed to be. And a life that will be supernaturally used of God, the hallmark of that life is simple trust in God. I trust in God. You'll read it in the Psalms with, of, of David. You'll, you'll see it all throughout Scripture. Those who learn to trust in God, they are the ones that God will use. When we don't have to have a plan, we don't have to sit down and add to the, to the work of God. We don't have to reach our hand out to try to support the work of God that God's plan and God's provision is actually enough for each of us to move forward into the life plan that God has for us. Esther had no idea. I know she had no idea at the moment where she requires nothing to go in in her first encounter with the king. She requires nothing. She has no idea that her life is the life that's going to spare the lives of countless hundreds of thousands of her people. She has no idea that she's going to become a co-regent with her husband one day, and she's going to be rewriting the laws of death into laws of life. She has no idea what God is about to do, but she trusts that she is in the hand of God, and God is going to use her life for a divine purpose. If I can bring it to a summation, this particular thought this evening is don't add to what God has for your life, and you don't have to figure it all out. That's what makes a people a supernatural people when God starts doing sovereignly through your life what only God can do. You can't do it for yourself. You can't do it in yourself. And it makes no sense to the natural man. The, the, the person outside the kingdom of God, the ways of God are total foolishness to that particular person. Esther moves initially into this encounter with the king with a simple trust in her heart. And, and I believe that was the preliminary test. Not adding, not, not scheming, not asking for, for things that really she didn't need to do what she was called to do. Because later on, she was going to have to go in again with the things that God had provided. Through prayers and through fasting, she was going to have to go in and trust in simple intercession that the hand of the king was going to move in her direction and the mercy of the king and the favor of the king was going to be given to her. And later on, when she arranged a banquet to expose the enemy of God's people. She had enough wisdom not to speak the first night at the banquet, but to wait. See, she had learned to trust in God. And until God gave the word, she was not to speak. Until God unfolded the plan, she was not to try to unfold it herself. She could have done it so much sooner. But see, she was a young girl who simply learned to trust in God and that God will give me everything I need to do His work. And quite often, it will appear to be foolish in the sight of natural people and maybe even in your own sight. Think of David for a moment when he goes down to the brook to pick five smooth stones out of a brook to fight against a nine-foot-nine nine giant who's been a warrior from his youth, whose who's tip of his spear alone weighs 15 pounds. He's wearing a coat of iron that weighs 125 pounds, and he's going to fight against him with five little pebbles out of a brook. It would have seemed ridiculous, but it was what God had provided for the battle. Think of Moses heading out of, uh, into Egypt with his staff and his one-line sermon and his, his brother who was not even fully engaged in the things of God, thinking this in the natural, this is ridiculous. I've got to have more than this. Surely I've, I've got to maybe contact some of my old friends in the palace and see if they can muster together at least some people with political influence or, or some kind of a ragtag army that we can put together to, to make ourselves more of an imposing threat when we come before the throne of Pharaoh. But no, this man had just a simple trust that the one-line sermon and the stick in his hand and his older brother was going to be enough to defeat one of the largest and most powerful armies on the earth of his day and bring millions of his own countrymen out of bondage and into freedom. You think of Gideon heading up a mountainside in, in groups of 100, 300 of them all together with a sword and a jar and a torch in their hand, and nothing more of a battle plan. That's all they needed. That's what God gave them for this battle. 
He gave them a plan, and he gave them a sword, he gave them a torch, and he gave them a clay jar, and said, you just do it my way, and there's going to be a wonderful victory won against 135,000 Midianites that had come in prepared to fight and prepared to devour the land. Jonathan, all he had was a sword and an armor bearer who was with him in heart, climbing up on their hands and knees up on this mountainside to take a half acre back from a garrison of the Philistine army. And how about Samson, where the Lord sent him out to uh, fight against some of the Philistine army with nothing more than the donkey's jawbone in his hand. Not only did, was it a weapon that succeeded in defeating a thousand warriors, but it also gave him drink out of the hollow in the jaw. You see, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, the writer of Hebrews says, what more shall I say? Time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms. See, their faith had a forward motion to it, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant or courageous in battle, and turned to flight the armies of the aliens. I encourage you again, read Hebrews chapter 11. It's all about the weak and the afflicted and the nobodies and the nothings of society that God raised up. And through them, his kingdom advanced because their faith had a forward motion. And so I want to challenge all that are listening today. I challenge the young people in this sanctuary. I challenge those that are online tonight. Let your faith have a forward motion, not just to get you out of something, but to get you into where you need to go. Not to get you just out of Egypt, but get you into the promised land. Your faith must have a forward motion. And that forward motion is literally fueled by the desire to bring glory to God again in the earth. The desire to say, Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to be honored through my life. I want you to use my life for a healing oil for those that have no joy, no hope, and no future. I want you to use me as a key to unlock prison doors. I want you to use me, God, as a voice that can, that can conquer as it is the voices of the enemy that are trying to push people into depression and drugs and suicide. God Almighty, in the name of Jesus, use my life for your glory. That is the, that is the cry that produces a forward motion. That is the cry of the heart that says, God, I trust you. You will put into my hand everything I need. I don't have to scheme this. I don't have to plan this. I don't have to strategize this. You will lead me. You will be the voice that says, this is the way, walk in it. And you'll give me what I need. If I need a word of wisdom, you'll give me a word of wisdom. If I need the faith to believe somebody can be healed, you'll put that faith in my heart before you put it in my hand and in my voice. If I need to be a key to unlock somebody's prison door, you'll give me the courage to approach that place of darkness and the courage to believe that there's no door, there's no barrier that can stop the hand and the word of Almighty God through Jesus Christ. This is the forward motion of faith. For, for much too long, many of God's people have, have just stayed in a place where the devil has told them, don't move because you're this or you're that, because you're depressed or you're addicted or you're, or you're poor or you're uneducated or whatever it is you are. But God says, no, rise up, my beloved army. Rise up, people of God. Rise up and let me one more time be God to you and let me be God through you and let me show through you to this generation that I indeed am still God. I am all-powerful. I have all knowledge. I created all things, and I will be here when this world is folded up and recreated. When it's all over, I'll still be here. Let me show you once again who I am. By taking a weak, by taking a marginalized, by taking those of you listening to me online tonight that have come to the understanding, or this world has tried to tell you you're never going to amount to anything. Your life will never have any kind of a divine purpose. It's time to put that thinking under your feet. It's time to tread on those words of the devil himself and stand up in your living room and say, no, I'm going forward in the strength of my God. And God will give me what I need. If it's some spices, some ointments, some stones, a stick, if it's a one-line sermon, it doesn't matter. God has already proven to me that he's able to bring people out of bondage and into freedom through the weakest vessel in his hand. 
I refuse to be still in this generation. I refuse to lay down and suffer defeat and let that be the portion of my life when people all around me are headed for an eternal hell without the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to just tell them who God is. I'm going to let God show them who he is through my life by the grace of Almighty God. And I'm going to start at the beginning and I'm going to go in with what God gives me and do what God calls me to do in the strength of God's Holy Spirit. You are the end time army of God. Listen to me. You who have come to believe that you'll never amount to anything more than a drug addict or a poor person or somebody that no li- nobody listens to. You are no different from those who have come before you all through scriptural history. It is God who has taken the barren womb to produce a voice that can guide the nation. It is God who causes the blind men to see and gives them a testimony to tell others, I used to be blind, but the hand of Christ touched me and now I can see. It is God who raises people out of death and brings them into life. It is God who opens prison doors and we, we beckon to the prisoners behind us, follow me as I follow Christ. It is God who takes the weak and the weary and the nobodies and the nothings and the marginalized of society and raises us up to be a victorious, mighty army. Hallelujah. Not in our strength, but in our weakness and in the strength of our God. So I'm calling you, rise up, O church of God. Rise up, beloved bride of Jesus Christ. Let something get into your spirit that says, enough of this. Enough of being beaten by the winds of life. Enough of being cast down by the works of darkness. I'm going to stand up and in the power of my God, I'm going to let him declare his own majesty, his own glory, his own grace, his own power, his own victory through my life. As weak as it might be, it's not about me anymore. It's about the Christ in me who raises men and women from the dead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Remember this one thing. The gospel we preach is about dead men living. Hallelujah. 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 We're going to come to the communion table this evening. And while we prepare to do that, our worship team is going to return to the platform to sing, to lead us in a song of praise. And while we prepare to come to the communion table, remember, remember that the Son of God went to a cross died on that cross in your place to pay the price for the sin, which means the wrong that you've done against the way God says you should live, speak, or be. He took your place. When you believed on him, your sin was washed away. The Spirit of God came and took up residence inside your life, and you became a new creation. And as you confess him with your mouth, every promise in this book that was given to you and given to me by the shed blood of Jesus Christ becomes ours. And with the promises comes the power to start moving forward in Christ's name. So we're going to come. We're going to share communion together. And as we do, I encourage you to believe that not only are you forgiven your sin, but you have become a new creation in Christ. God's going to do something marvelous through your life. Get some juice, get some crackers, some bread, whatever you have, and we're going to have communion together in just a moment. the work 
For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Hallelujah. Lord, what you provided for us on the cross is sufficient for each of us to become everything that you have destined us to be. We don't have to add to it. We don't have to take away from it. Lord Jesus Christ, it's enough. And don't let it ever look foolish in our sight, God. Help us, Lord, to have the eyes of faith and not natural eyes. Help us to see that what you give, Lord, is oft times to show us that yours is the power, it's the kingdom, it's the glory. It's all about you, Lord. So, Father, I thank you, God. I thank you, Lord. I want to just have a prayer before we close with a song tonight just for everybody this is something the spirit of god's put on my heart everybody who says i'm going to go forward with what god gives me i don't need anything else could you just raise your hand wherever you are in the sanctuary or i'm just going forward with what god gives me now make it a prayer make it a dedication of your life right now father we don't need more than who you are we don't need anything greater than your word and your spirit 
We don't need any more, God, than the giftings that you give to those that you call to do your work. And so, Lord, even if it looks foolish to the natural man, we're going to go forward with what we have. And just like Esther, we're going to believe that our lives are going to be used of you to bring great freedom and even to rewrite laws of death into laws of life. We're going to believe, like Hannah, that our prayers are going to be heard and in our barrenness, life is going to be produced. And not only life, but a voice that can guide the nation. God, give us your voice. Give us a voice that can guide the nation through this darkness we're now in. Father, thank you. Even now, I'm asking you to raise up people in their living rooms. Raise them up in their bedrooms. Those that are sitting on benches with their cell phones, those that are in their cars listening to this prayer meeting tonight, raise them up. Raise them up by the Spirit of Almighty God. Raise up your army as you did in Ezekiel's day. Raise up the bones, Lord, that have died around altars. Put breath upon them. Put sinews and muscle and put the breath of God in us and let us be an exceeding great army again in our generation. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that oft times you have to wait till we're nothing to, so that we can understand that you are everything to us. You are mercy, you are wisdom, you are righteousness, you are redemption, you are life, you are strength, you are eternity. To you belongs the glory. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory now and forever and ever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, raise your people. Lord, raise your people, God. All around the globe, those that have sent in prayer requests from Africa tonight, from India, from Asia, from Europe, from Canada, from the United States, God, from all around the world, from Central America. My God, raise your church. Raise your church, Lord Jesus Christ. Raise your whole body. Let your Holy Spirit come, Lord, and let there be a song of glory to you in the earth, my God, in this last day. Do it supernaturally, Lord. Do it sovereignly. Do it in the way that only you can. Hallelujah. Bring a glorious, glorious harvest of souls into your house and into your kingdom in this last day. And let it be done, Lord, through those of us who'd never believe that you could use us for your glory. Oh God, oh God, let our faith lead us forward. In Jesus' mighty and glorious and unmatchless name, in his name we pray, amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to go with a song of victory tonight. And I, I want that song to stay in your heart. Don't let it die at the end of this meeting. But sing it all night. Sing it when you get up in the morning. Sing it throughout your days. God is going to use you for his glory in this generation. I look forward to hearing of the exploits that God's going to do through your life. Bless you. See you soon.